between people. The first one is the emotive cognitive level, and the social one is the context of situation, the embeddedness of language in the cultural and social context. Here we can refer to famous anthropologist Irving Gottman's work. He distinguished between what he calls a reply and a response. A reply is on the linguistic level, immediately replying, a response is something deeper that goes across an entire talk. So if you don't understand one of the sentences I, I say, you might give uh, a, a, a wrong reply. But if you don't understand anything, your response will be incorrect. Then we have the paradigm of intercultural miscommunication. Here we have the work of John Gumpert, who speaks of misusing contextualization things. There's a famous example that he gives of an Indian waitress in Heathrow Airport who uses uh, a, a different type of intonation that the British English addressees usually uh, are going to hear. So this waitress says things like gravy, gravy instead of gravy, going up. And the customers complain about the impoliteness of the same waitress, not knowing that there was a transfer, I don't speak any Indian language, there was a transfer from the native language into British English that was responsible for this, uh, this mismatch. That's what is called the contextualization use. Misunderstanding is also a, defined as a mismatch of frames. You probably know the work by Deborah Tunnel, very famous social linguist, Georgetown University. She spoke about differences between men and women, how they normally misunderstand because they frame things differently. If a man pays a compliment to a woman, she may frame it as a put down, whereas he meant it as a genuine compliment that is a difference in frames. And then there are, of course, the important difference in communicative styles and politeness. Politeness is probably the most important research uh, domain inside misunderstanding research. We can uh, distinguish uh, different ways of accessing this politeness. And politeness, as you all know, presumably is one of the basic social guidelines for communication and for interaction. It is related to social norms governing a society. It's a pragmatic phenomenon that is related to philosophical principles. It's related to speech, styles, and formality, and it is related to what has been called the management of face. So people don't lose their own face, or they don't make other people's faces uh, damage to them. I have uh, set up some time ago three different levels of politeness at which cultural differences come in. There are two levels that I think are universal, the biological, psychosocial level, where human beings are basically all alike. They all have a basic drive of being together with other people and keeping their own private self. This has been called a positive and negative politeness. The philosophical maxims, for instance, suggested by Jeffrey Leach of Lancaster University, relate to principles such as the tact principles, that people keep, be tactful, be empathetic, feel with their interactors. And thirdly, the third level is the culture-specific level, where we have descriptions of distinctness in cultures, that people behave differently in, in different situations. The third level, the third strand of research that is important for misunderstanding is the pragmatic theory-based analysis. Here we have the research by John Searle, famous speech act philosopher, follower of John Watson of Oxford University Press, and also of my colleagues Shoshana Gokurka and Ada Weizmann of uh, Jerusalem, the Hebrew University. And here, when analyzing talk, people ask questions as, what did the speaker say? What was he talking about? Why did he bother to say what he said? And why did he say the way he said it? Which refers to the tone of something that was pronounced. 
Fourthly, we have philosophical views of the self-orientedness of communication. Most of the communication research in the past has been what one can call mutuality oriented, following Paul Rice. People actually pay attention to what another person says. There is, however, a research strand that claims that communication is not mutual, mutuality oriented. Rather, um, it is compared, as Emmanuel Levinas and Karl Jaschok said, everybody speaks for him, him or herself. Communication is like a dance. Everybody, people don't really listen to one another. They are basically self-oriented. And this is why misunderstanding occurs. Similar is the fifth and next to last research strand that I have um, identified. It relates to speakers' mental processes and reminds one of Freud's famous slips of the tongue, which means that people say something that they didn't really want to say because something else was on their mind. Okay, this is the tip of the tongue. And misunderstanding here results from people's mindless, automatic, and non-thoughtful behavior. This is research by Ellen Langer, who wrote a beautiful book about the mindlessness of everyday talk. And the people engage in what I have called lean cognitive actions. What this means is that in people's brains, there are many ready-made schemata, scripts, uh, social episodes that are stored in people's minds so they don't really bother to listen properly to what another person has said to them. I have a little anecdote that uh, illustrates this. A friend of mine who uh, used to be a teacher of English in a German secondary school had a history of always complaining in the classroom how badly she felt, how she had a migraine headache, how she you know, could hardly come to work or whatever. And the head of the department on one Monday morning asked her, how are you, Mrs. Graves, so, uh, her name? And she again said, oh, I feel terrible. And the head of the department said, after she had said that, oh, I'm pleased to hear that. Quite obviously, he had not listened to her because in his mind, he had thought that this woman always complained, which means uh, that he sort of the input was denied. And that happens in many instances of everyday life. There is a famous example in the literature of the so-called restaurant script that some of you may have heard about. When you enter a restaurant, you know exactly what you're supposed to do. That you get your table, you order a meal, after the meal, you pay the bill, and then you exit, and so on. All these steps are stored in your mind. You don't have to think about it at all. So that is also what can lead to misunderstandings if something different happens to which you are not prepared. Okay. The last and probably most productive research strand is information processing approaches to analyzing misunderstanding. Here we can start from below where we have, first of all, a minimally structured knowledge system that feeds into the context of a particular communicative event and it leads to particular online structures, and it finally leads to densely associated different knowledge sets. I give you an, an example of a model that my husband, Willis Edmondson, who unfortunately died recently, originally designed. I applied this model and changed it and revised it a couple of times. It assumes, again, scripted behavior, postulates frames and schemata, and basically operates on two levels, a higher cognitive, conceptual one, and a lower linguistic one. You also have this on your handout, uh, which you can consult later on. So if you have the input, and you first of all move up on this schemata to the cognitive level, you have an interactional goal, you have an operant discourse frame that's basically the knowledge, your knowledge that's stored in your brain. You make a prediction, an expectation of what your, the other person says to you. You decode the linguistic uh, message variously. You infer the meaning and so on. 
Then you come up with a basic discourse meaning representation and you move to an emotive cognitive reaction in the center of the model that is very important because it means you either, and that is automatic, that's what humans share with animals, you either have a positive gut reaction, you like the person or what he or she says, or you dislike it, you doubt it, whatever. But we are human beings and not animals and no longer little children, so we do not, most often, do not dare to give this gut reaction. We wrap it up in discourse strategies. If you don't like a person, you wouldn't say that, but you would wrap it up by saying something nice. Then you come up with a cognitive plan, and then you encode something in English. All this, of course, does not uh, develop uh, in different spots, but it goes, in, uh, goes on in the brain very fast and basically at the same time. Okay? Now, I will give you a little uh, insight into the type of research that I conducted on the basis of all these research trends and also on the basis of this model. This is an empirical study carried out at the University of Hamburg. The data is naturally occurring dynamic interactions because it's between people of different cultural backgrounds, in my case, an American exchange student, or several American exchange students, and their native German interlocutors, either in German or in English. The example I'm going to show you was conducted in German with my translations. And the hypothesis that I had for this the case study was that different communicative styles actually cause misunderstandings. And there is uh, an emphasis on particular critical, uh, critical incidents. What I did in this research, just to give you a bit more details, is that I gave the interaction a little recording device that they carried with them all the time, and they just recorded their interactions in dormitories, in shops, and so on. And then I would, together we looked for these rich points, as this is called in the literature. What I also did, this is a larger project that I conducted over, over decades actually, I interviewed mostly American students that came to Germany. I did role plays with them. I asked them to keep a diary. I had my own field notes. I probably will take notes when I got to get home about what happened to me here. And uh, all these different data sets proved insightful for um, collecting misunderstandings. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, this is one little case study uh, that uh, I gave the name Too Much Rice. And you find out what happened in this interaction between um, uh, an American exchange student who invites his German friend for dinner because the German friend has helped him or had helped him with a particular task, a uh, seminar paper or a lecture or whatever. Okay. So this is uh, what happened. I will read to you the, um, the English translation of the German uh, interaction. So Brian is the, um, the American and Andy is the German, Andreas. Okay. So Brian says, hello, um, and how are you? And then he says, yeah, fine. Oh, fine, really. And Brian says, so everything's ready now. I hope you like it. I cooked it myself. Because, yeah, yeah, the other one says, that's what we eat in the South. He's from Texas. And then he says, but that's far too much rice. So much rice, far too much rice. And Brian says, that doesn't matter. I paid for it. And I have limited, you have, and it's done with. And, and he says, it does matter. It does. Think of the many poor people who go hungry and would like to eat something like that. 